Right on. Thank you for doing this. Uh, as mentioned in that uh, that tweet to you, you're you're straight up one of the reasons why I got into the industry as well. So, whoa. <laughs> what? Why? Why? I think it was just it because of you know the time. It was just different than it is today. Not that it wouldn't be the you know. It, it would probably be the same if I was a an impressionable youth, and I was just such a music fan, and just the way that you. I don't know. It was just everything about much music was so cool like everything about it was cool and you know it was you it was like steve anthony certainly george and like ed the sock and it just it, everything about that time was so right you'll agree right it was just well it's different i have a different perspective not not to say it wasn't cool but i was in it it's very different when you're sort of living backstage, you don't see it the same way. I'm not impressed by it the same way because, you know, just, I knew that it was cool, but I, you know, you never really understand the impact uh, or we didn't really understand the impact that we were having on other people. Right, and so what were you doing like what was the job prior to to much? Well, I, it was my first. Well, it wasn't my first job. Um, I was doing things like I worked at record stores, DJed in clubs, managed bands. I was went to university. I was deeply immersed in the music industry from the time I was seventeen. I worked at a radio station when I was seventeen. Like yeah. I was in. So that's the path. You're that's the path, and then I had a path. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So how did you get the gig? Like, what was it? A, a just a did you apply, or would they reach out to you and go like, "Hey, you you want to do something that's unique and cool?" And how did that happen? No one ever says, "Hey, do you want to apply?" That's that's not the way it works. It's it worked uh, for me. Someone came up to you and offered you a job off the street, like no after a few years of grinding it out uh-huh yeah but the same could you could i mean this, you were saying you were you were djing before like yeah no no i wasn't djing no. i was working at the radio station oh, okay. i was 17 okay so no and and i was djing in bars which right. is and that was in montreal and this was in toronto so it's com very different but what right. i did was you know i asked for everything that i want I work for everything that I have. Right. Hard, really, really hard. Still to this day. Yeah, same. I mean, the, the name, my name certainly has cachet now. People will take my calls, but they don't often give me the jobs still to this day. So I'm in the same boat as everybody, even though I have a ton of experience and, um, can basically handle anything now in the world of broadcast. Yeah. Still, I have my own challenges. Um, so, you know, people say to me, oh, you're so lucky. And my back kind of gets up because I'm not lucky. I'm no, not I'm a lucky. hard worker. Hard, very hard worker. And, you know, in my podcast, have you been listening to the podcast? I listened to it, yeah. I listened to the one with George. So when you hear everybody's story, because now we've released 10 episodes so far. When you listen to the stories, there's one thing that everybody has in common, which is they're super hard workers. Right. Some people were, um, had like interesting ways that they found the opportunity to work at much, but they all over delivered in their day-to-day -day job. And when they left much, they all, most of them continue to work because they know how to work hard. So they, no, oh, my, my, that's my daughter. Hold on a sec. Do you mind? Of course. Uh, 
intermission. I'm on the phone with someone else right now, so I can't. But Daddy can maybe call and ask them how to find the password. Um, but our our TV, you go to Bell Five, and then you, you, it's one of the. Um, is that Daddy not there? Yeah. That's cute. Okay, and you'll find look at on demand, and you'll see Crave. Okay. Bye, sweetie. Sorry. That's okay. That's There's okay. only one call or really two, three calls that I'll take. Right. And she's one, my son's the other, and my husband's the other. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, not at all. Um, what, what was oh, the music like in your house then as a, like as a kid growing up? What are your, what are your, what are your parents playing? Oh, I had a sort of unusual childhood for two reasons. My parents were kind of hippies um, in, a, in, a, in a way, conservative, but kind of hippie-ish. And they, when I was about six years old, they bought a summer camp in the middle of nowhere, which is still running. Um, so the road into camp was five miles. So if you can just it's it's still in the middle of nowhere and <laughs> they bought it 50 years ago right so my sister and i every weekend almost the whole year round we would drive to the summer camp which was usually empty only in the summer where they're kids right right so we uh, we would drive from montreal to this camp so it was a four-hour drive there and back so we relied a lot on eight track players yes <laughs> so I think back in the time we listened to Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, B.J. Thomas, Joan Baez, Woodstock, Barbara Streisand. Um, trying to think what other. There weren't that many. Like they only had a few eight tracks. They're expensive, right? So. Right. Um, and that's kind of what we listened to in the car. Yeah. But my uncle, my mother's brother was a music freak. So driving up to camp was one thing, but while we were at camp where my uncle kind of lived, he always had sort of a bevy of teenagers with him. And so there was always music of the time. So I was into like the Stones and the Beatles and um, even Elvis Presley, they used to play that a lot at camp and the Who and Led Zeppelin and, you know, so I, I was hanging out with kids that were older than me and my uncle was obsessed with music. So I remember when I was five, I, I was listening to the monkeys with him, like Stepping Stone and stuff. Like I just, I've always been around it. Yeah, same. So music has always been a big part of my life and um, I'm not musically inclined. So all I wanted to do was be around the people who can make the music. Right. And, and what was the first concert that you went to? Uh, it was David Cassidy from the Partridge family. And my dad took me. And David Cass, I remember it because he was wearing, I didn't understand at the time, but he was wearing a white jumpsuit with sparkles and fringes, which now I understand was very Elvis Presley at the time. He walked on stage and all the girls started shrieking. And I looked at my dad and covered my ears and cried and left yeah. because I couldn't hear the music. And, and thus began Erica Ernest M. And I'm still like that. I like to listen to music. Yeah. Um, music has meaning to me. And even back then I, I, I wasn't like a screaming girl, even though I love the music so much. It was listening to it, not screaming to it that mattered. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the that's the lost art of, you know, grabbing the LP and, and sitting down and reading the liner notes and reading yeah. the lyrics and like, oh, cool, it got produced in Van Nuys, California. Yeah. Whatever it was, or was this guy's guesting on as the guitarist on that specific song? Isn't that guy from that band? And I think that's, that's what's kind of lost in music yeah. in the last 
Yeah. Well, I think, you know, just in general, depth has sort of dissipated to some degree because we live in a squirrel economy where, you know, everything is short little bursts. My kids are growing up with Snapchat and TikTok, right. which are all like 30 second little bits of information thrown at them. So they're getting a lot of information, but it doesn't require attention span, nor does it allow them to go deeper. Right. It doesn't require too much effort either. No. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, Erica, I want to get to some of these questions because uh, you you might imagine when I said that you were going to be a guest, there was just an influx of fan questions. So uh, Michael wants to know, he goes, I got a dumb question. Why did much music and MTV stop playing music videos? Uh, Michael, that's a great question. I left 10 years before, so I can't answer from firsthand experience. I can guess that it was money related. And I can also guess that it probably coincided with the era of YouTube, where people could start accessing videos on their own. But what people didn't understand, as they headed off to YouTube and left much music behind, that they would soon drown in a sea of uncurated music. And that they would lose the sort of insights, leadership um, of the people who were on much music or hosts who were knowledgeable about music and would sort of curate or sieve through, sift through the music and share their favorites and give insights and go a little deeper. You don't get that with YouTube by watching them, you do get to own the experience yourself, which is great. And you don't have to rely on waiting for much music to play the stuff, but that was part of it, wasn't it? It was the it anticipation, totally was. it was the, oh, they're playing it and you run it because you didn't have a lot of chance. I guess that's sort of the scarcity concept, right? Yeah. And that disappeared because suddenly you could have anything you wanted but you didn't have us. Exactly. And you also didn't have the chance to PVR things and just a different time. Again, back to the how we started the conversation. I don't know, PVR right. thing was, that was kind of an annoying it, part of it that right. you, know, you had to record things. And I never did because I was doing it. And now I love seeing stuff show up on YouTube that, features me some old interviews because I don't have any footage I don't yeah. I never kept anything so it's really fun to you know so if anybody is listening and finds some interesting old stuff on YouTube show it to me tag, tag you. to I like yeah. to show my kids too yeah that's cool yeah your uh, mom's I, cool I think that uh you may have a mutual friend uh Neil Morrison who was brother Bill on Edge 102 in Toronto Okay. So he goes, you may want to ask uh, what it was like being put on air with little advice or direction. Moses would literally put people in front of the camera and say, go. Is that true? Well, it, was, it was a blessing and a curse. And he's absolutely right. Wow. In some ways. Uh, when I went on the air, I didn't, I wasn't a trained broadcaster. I didn't go to broadcasting school, but I had been working in the music business at that point for about five years, which was a lot considering I was 23. So I didn't have the skills to uh, assemble a story in a sort of quote professional way, but I think my enthusiasm made up for it to some degree. And then as I stayed with the job and Moses supported me as I learned in front of the country, which was challenging. Then I learned the skills of broadcasting and that was his whole philosophy, which was anybody could be a broadcaster, but not anybody has the expertise or enthusiasm or is a content specialist. So at Much Music, he would always find people who were obsessed with music in some form or that they were obsessed with comedy or they had some sort of a vibe about them. And then on the sister station, City TV, he always 
hired people or he tended to hire people who had less broadcast experience, but were lawyers or um, prosecutors or um, environmentalists. And then they all learned on the job. Hmm. Interesting. So somebody that had a, a story to tell and, and yeah. and yeah, that's, I mean, how cool is that? That's groundbreaking on its, on its own. Yeah. Well, you see, Moses was and is brilliant because he looks at broadcasting very differently, I think. And I love, and I'm speaking for him, and I don't know if this is absolutely true, but my interpretation is that he thinks of the audience, first of all, with respect, and he wants his shows are of the people. They're not at the people, it's of the people. So he wants his hosts to look like regular people and to act like regular people, not like stars, but like awesome regular people, people who were become role models or thought leaders, but they are real. You can relate to them. You can believe them. You can trust them. And the stories often include people on the street because you know, we're more interesting than anything fabricated, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Fact is always more interesting than fiction. Truth is always crazier. So he has always sort of gone to the street to get inspiration for his shows. And in doing so, built such strong community, which I think is lacking in most broadcasters. There's still those big monoliths are still pushing content at us. And we all go like, fuck off, stop mm -hmm. telling me what to do. And that's why we keep on gravitating to social media where we have a voice. And right. at City TV, we had a voice, which is why we loved it. Interesting. And, um, and how much do you think that podcasting plays into the way that people are starting to I don't know, just change the, their style of consumption. A hundred percent. That's another example of the democratization of media where people aren't listening to radio the same way. Those hours that you're spending listening to podcasts, you're not turning on your radio because the radio talks at you and podcasters are intimate, they're thought provoking and they're not often polished. And that's what people want, is they want authentic. They want real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I did 20 years of just terrestrial radio. I did 15 years at Fox here in Vancouver. Uh, and then when I got let go, so many of my friends were like, dude, like you are, you, you need to stay in Vancouver, start a podcast, talk to all the businesses you've, you know, emceed things for or hosted events or you just know, a general manager or whatever and see if they'll sponsor you and so i'm can into you make a living yeah you're this? seven you're you're seven doing this yeah and so you you make so what's the, your business model when you do a podcast how does well, it work? i mean i kind of just re, as much as it sucks to say i just re, i relied on what i know yeah. and that's radio so my my podcast is i, I play five songs all Vancouver indie artists. I was the indie music director at Seafox. Uh, so I knew the, I knew the scene. I do a live show at the, at the right. Well, not now cause COVID, but uh, so it's three guests a week, music, sports, entertainment. Then I do a couple features within the, the podcast. And then I uh, put the music in to kind of make it a show. So it's more than anything. It's just a long form radio show. So if you've listened to me over the years, Instead of the four hours, you get an hour and a half and it's only once a week. But how do you make money doing that? That's, so, that's the challenge, right? For yeah. So you. the money, I, I, I make money by, uh, again, talking to the people that I knew from my radio connections. So I'll talk to like a beer company who uh, the beer company has been on since I launched seven years ago. Who's your sponsor? Uh, Let's say hi. Red truck beer. Great guys. Yay. Yay. yay red truck. I know. Right. And like, they're supporting you know, local. I, I yes, exactly. They're supporting local, but also I know from working in radio for so long that 
companies don't advertise for seven straight years. Mm. They do six months, they take a few months off, they jump on for again, but these guys have been on since the start. Seriously, that's, that's awesome. That's right. Really and, and, and same for, you know, the majority of them have been on for years, three, four years in a row. Yeah, I don't, for my podcast reinvention of the VJ, yeah. I don't have a sponsor. I, I don't really, I'd love to have someone sponsor it. I would love to have like Molson Canadian or um, right. Pepsi Power Hour or so, you know, it'd be fun to get a brand that used to sponsor much music back in the day to come back in and do that right. kind of thing. Don't you think that would be I, hilarious? I bet, I bet you if you approached them, they would say, yeah, as long as you weren't like too insane with your pricing. If you were like, yeah, I don't know, a couple grand a month, I'll make sure people know about your brand. They'd be like, all right, I'm in. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, yeah. Um, okay, back to the question. Sarah, uh, what have you been binge watching during the pandemic? Losses? Oh, God, what a great question. I know, right? <gasps> well, like everybody else, being locked down and lonely, um, I've been watching so much TV. And the problem is that historically, when I'm, when I'm, sort of bored, I make something. So I've been doing a lot of stuff, which I can talk about, but I've never been this bored. And because I'm <laughs> locked down, I've been watching TV in, in ways I've never, ha I never have before. So Damn. the two shows, my two favorites, first one is The Americans. Oh, I don't know. Oh my God, Todd. Right, writing it, it down. Is, <laughs> it's old already. I think it, it wrapped like three years ago. I, I discovered it late. I remember it winning a lot of awards at like the Golden Globes or something or the Emmys. And it stars Carrie Russell. Okay. And her and her husband, whose name I can't remember, but the act, actually it's her husband in real life now. They play Russian spies who are um, sent to the United States to live as Americans and infiltrate the secrets of America. And it is riveting. I feel like the that acting, could actually be happening present day and we wouldn't even bat an eye about it. Well, it is happening. There's, there, this show is loosely based on a few books that have come out. It absolutely happens, that, which is what's so crazy. Because this is one of those, you know, um, truth is way stranger than than fiction. This is, I mean, it's a little extreme, apparently, like the books that have been written, there isn't as much violence and, you know, craziness, but people do it. They move to a country, they assume the country's uh, identity. So, you know, the Russian speaking their, their Russian uh, language disappears and they sound like Americans. Obviously they are Americans, but you know, yeah. um, and they raise, they have children. These are two spies who didn't know each other. They were told to have children and raise them in America and become inconspicuous. Oh God, so I'm by day, this. by day they were travel agents and at night, they were international spies. It was, wow. it's brilliant. Like, it is the best show I've ever seen in my life, aside from maybe Northern Exposure. Great show. Also, Outlander. I do love Outlander. Oh. Yes. And most recently, because I'm so obsessed with the Americans and was so sad when it ended, my friend told me to start watching Felicity which stars Carrie Russell 20 years ago as a um, young woman, teenager, I'm not sure how old she is, in her first year of college. And it's written by J.J. Abrams, who has gone on oh, yeah. to you know, great fame with Star Trek, et cetera. And um, my kids are of that age. This show is, again, I love it. And this, this show is on, it started in the mid nineties, early nineties, but I had no interest at that time. That was exactly something that I had zero interest 
I didn't care about college or university. I was on much music. I was in my early 30s, so I'd passed those years. I wasn't a mom yet, so I wasn't interested from that perspective. But now it's, and the writing is brilliant. It's won all kinds of awards. So mm -hmm. I'm watching a 20 year old show right now right. and am currently obsessed with a show about amazing. college. And, and what a time to binge watch. There's so many good shows. Thank God. There are, yeah. Thank God for binge watching. Uh, Melinda says, I was just talking about her and much music with a friend this past weekend. I go back and watch the Kurt Cobain interview often. I remember recording it on my VHS when it aired. I love that interview. He seemed to let his guard down with her a little bit. I'd love to hear her impressions of that interview and how she managed to connect with him. Great question. I had no idea at the time that, that would be the interview that has kind of defined my career. And what's interesting is that it didn't define my career at the time. At the time, it was just like, yeah, it was a pretty cool interview. Yeah. But when it was posted on YouTube about five years ago, outside of much music, where anybody could see it, and this also after, long after the death of Kurt Cobain, it kind of reemerged from the, uh, the vaults of much music. And listening to him speaking today with the insights that we have, knowing that he killed himself a few months later, the, the conversation takes on additional depth, I guess. Um, it was very strategic. I did very strategically approach it in a different way. Um, when he walked, first of all, it was a junket. So if you're not in the industry, you may not know what that term means, but essentially a junket is um, when a record company or a movie company invites a whole bunch of media to congregate in one area. Usually it's a hotel and you're given a hotel room and the star goes from room to room or the media, the star sits there and the media goes in and out of that room and has a short period of time. So we were the Canadian contingent to interview him. I wasn't a big fan, by the way, of oh. them. Uh, I liked them, but I wasn't, like I wasn't a rabid fan or anything like that. And I was very worried because I had heard that he's very anti-media because he's sort of anti-authority, right? Like he's, he mm. was, he's an underground dude. And, you know, we come in, hi, how are you? Hey, Kurt, I was wondering, tell me about the first cut on the album, you know, bullshit. So my strategy was different. When he walked in, I said to him, hey, I'm Erica. Um, do you want to do the interview in the bed or on the back balcony? And he was like, what? And he, I remember his face looking kind of uncomfortable because I was asking him to jump into bed with him with a camera. And he said, oh, I'll do it on the, on the back. And I was hoping that he would do it on the back anyway. But so we did it on the balcony. Which, so, you know, that scene now you can, when you've seen yep. it, you know, you see Seattle behind us. And I wanted to talk to him like a human being. And I figure if you talk to someone like a human being, they'll drop their guard and talk to you like a human being. So if you listen to my language, it's very colloquial. It's, I'm kind of goofy, very, not low brow, but very understated and not professional on purpose. And my strategy worked, I disarmed him and we had a real conversation. And I listened while he was talking. He saw my face reacting to what he was saying. And so he was like, hey, you know, this girl actually is interesting and interested. And so he got to actually talk about things that are important to him. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, you know, looking back on it, it was, it turned out really well, it was very special. I love interviewing. Wish I could do it all the time. 
which is why I started my podcast, right? Because then I yeah. can, then I could do what I love. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Uh, that that's that's a band for me. I never did get to see one of the one of the f- few. You know, working at a rock station, I saw them all, but I didn't get to see Nirvana. Mm. Never did. What a shame. Um, Mike says, "Hey, are you a fan of watching sports? Who's your team?" Um, I would say 100% no. <laughs> yes. Uh, Christopher, Christopher, not at all. Uh, Christopher Ford says, uh, God, I loved her. While she was VJing for midday, what would it, a typical day be like? And what would happen between songs? I think we uh, kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, it was, it was a pretty crazy place. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm sure that you've seen like how the desks were part of the, we called it like a living environment. Um, so we were always on camera, even when we weren't on camera. If I wasn't on shift, but there was someone else on, I'd be in the background or something. And yeah, all the, everybody was sort of, we were a uh, cast in a way. That's everybody was. Part of the thing that made it cool. Yeah. It was a living environment. Um, our jobs, my job was, you know, to do everything. So there were no researchers, there were no writers, there was no directors, there was technical directors, but no director for the talent, uh, no producer, no makeup, no hair, no wardrobe. It was me. So my job was the day before to get a rundown of the videos that had been programmed or find out if I had been booked to do any of the interviews. And then there was no internet. So I'd have to go to the bookstore across the street from Much, buy magazines. Uh, Much Music had a bunch of magazines. We also had files where people had cut out articles from magazines and put it in files. So like there'd be a Nirvana file or something. And I would take that home if I was doing an interview with someone from Nirvana. And my job was to come up with what I would talk about in between each set. Something that was either about a band or something that could somehow make sense if I, to connect it with a band. So um, that's what we did. In between videos, I'd talk on the phone, I'd eat, I'd pee, usually in the bathroom. Yeah. My friends would come visit me. My mom would come by. My grandmother would come by. Yeah. Sometimes there were tours that would come through and we'd have to chat with people. Lots of phone calls. No, no uh, email. I right. wasn't distracted. By, no, no so internet. Email. Holy crap. There was a time when there was no internet. There was no email. I th- email was just starting at the time, but it was not an important part of the world at that point. Yeah. Um, but it was, uh, you know, I basically lived there. I lived at the Much Studios. It was really special. Lots yeah. of creative people, lots of chaos, never any quiet. You just never knew what would happen in there next. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Erica, thank you again for doing this. I told you I'd be like maybe 15 minutes. We're past half hour now. Are you still good for a little bit? Yeah, I'm just sitting up at my cottage. I have my, my dog with me. I have a client call in one hour and I want to take my dog for a walk. So I'm good for a little while. Okay. Okay. I want to bang out a few more here. Um, uh, Chris asks, he goes, Oh, nice. Ask her about her sister's book, which is coming out in May. Oh, uh, she's is- also a contributor to the awesome music project. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's right behind me. I don't know if you could see there's a table there and the awesome music project book is right behind me. Cool. Um, so I contributed uh, a story about how music impacted my life. And I think there were 200 other people or a hundred other people who did the same. It's a beautiful coffee book and the money raised goes towards education on how music can help depression and, um, and mood. So it's literally paying for research on um, music and mood. Uh, That's so great. It's, a, it's a great book. Um, the first part was about my sister's book. Yeah, what's going on? Uh, she has a new book. I don't know who this dude is, but this person is 
cool. Um, she's launching a book called Swagger in three months, I think. But when is your podcast airing? This is uh, the first one in Feb February 2nd. So we're a couple, two weeks out. Oh, too, too bad because on this Thursday, so in a couple of days, I'm doing a Facebook Live with my sister on um, the ymc.ca Facebook page, which is the website that I run. The Yummy there. Mummy Club, yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm going to be interviewing her about um, how to be an unapologetic, uh, badass mom. Oh, cool. Um, during this crazy time of COVID where we're all struggling. So her book really is about how to unleash your real authentic self and um, really excel uh, both professionally and as a person. She's, she's been um, a trainer and she's a creativity expert and uh, she's very bright, probably smarter than me, but I rarely <laughs> admit that. Yeah. And her book will be um, life-changing for people who read it. Oh, that's great. His name is Chris Brandt, by the way. Well, Chris, you're cool. Thank with, you. Uh, My I sister think, thanks you more. I think he helps out with Music Heals. Do you know Music Heals? I, I, I help don't. those guys out uh, every year as well. No, it's don't. kind of the same concept, I guess, uh, where they'll go to like old folks' homes where people have dementia mm -hmm. and, and all that and, and kind of just connect with them and and, uh, you know, people that have, that, that can't remember their kids' names will somehow remember the entire lyrics to an Elvis song. Yeah, I saw an incredible uh, video, I think it was on Facebook, where an, an ex-Russian ballerina who has Alzheimer's, who's basically, or dementia, who's basically comatose, um, one of the care workers, played the nutcracker and you watch her lift her head lift her whole body from a seating position she's in a wheelchair and dances the entire nutcracker with her arms and her body because she can't walk it's wow. incredible and as soon as the song ends she drops back into a com comatose state it it's really uncanny isn't that incredible? Yeah. Um, Steve, do you believe aliens have visited Earth? Mm, I really don't give a shit about that question. <laughs> and in fact, I know that you're having fun. So, but I'm really earnest. And what it makes me think a little bit about is this uh, proliferation of conspiracy theories and false information where everybody is an expert and people have no idea what the hell they're talking about. And so they say things and then people believe them. And I think that now more than ever, we have to understand that news, have, that words have power and to be really careful, even when you're making a joke, because I'm learning more and more how gullible people are Oh, and yeah. how they're looking for something strange to hold on to. And when we look at what's going on, I was going to say in the States, but also here with the rise of, you know, the Aaron O'Toole um, kind of leadership. And I'm getting a little political here, but I think that there should be different political parties. And I think that having a conservative party and a liberal party is fantastic. They keep each other in line. But what's happening is, these people are making up lies and sparking this uh, nagging doubt about the trustworthiness about our current government. They're trying to sow seeds of um, doubt that our government is, is like trying to do something behind our back, which is completely completely wrong and you're harming yourself and that guy Aaron O'Toole will say these things because he wants to be elected it's all because he wants to be the guy in power he's not saying things like 
as the leader of this party, I will do this. He'll say, he's saying, as the leader of a party, they're doing this wrong. As opposed to saying, I love this country. I want to roll up my sleeves and I want to do something positive and watch me do something positive. And then you'll see I'm a leader and a doer, pick me. Instead, he's playing these horrible games by sparking conspiracies about our current government that is having a terrible effect. People not believing that vaccines are not safe because we don't know and the people who own the vaccines and the government, they can't tell us exactly 100% that they're gonna be safe. There is risk involved as there always has been with vaccines. They're not saying that there isn't, but it's calculated risk. The, um, the positiveness or the potential upside of you know getting a vaccine versus not. Well, far it, outweighs it. It far outweighs it, right? Yeah. And the people who are on the other side are trying to poke holes in the concept of the vaccine for their own good. Right. It's crazy. It They're is crazy. They're playing with our health. Yeah. So, and, and somehow the people that are wearing masks and social distancing and actually helping each other, they're the sheeple. Like, really? Fuck off. Right. Right. And so for the person who asked that, you know, very innocent, silly question about aliens, please don't be offended by my rant. It's just really top of mind. And I think more people need to say it out loud and kind of, you know, it's the emperor's emperor's new clothes, you know, like, I think that's that these politicians like an Aaron O'Toole. And again, this isn't political, I would vote for someone in a conservative party who have fiscal differences than the liberals. That's I don't have a problem with that. But these people who are doing really terrible things to our ability to trust elected officials. Um, it's very damaging. Mm -hmm. But you didn't um, think you, you get that kind of an answer, did you? <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't actually know. Uh, Billy says, cool, loved her on much. Uh, she did some stuff for us last year on Jack when we flipped to Jill for International Women's oh, Day. Oh yeah, for Women's Day, right. She, she couldn't have been more amazing to work with. No question, just a comment. Uh, same for Jay. Jay goes, oh, cool. I've always wanted to be a VJ. I remember her looking into the camera and telling people to live up to their dreams. It really hit home. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, that is uh, cool. And in fact, that's, I still do that. And I think it's, again, I feel that there is a responsibility that I and you have, Todd, because you got a mic yep. and you have an audience who listen to you and trust you um, to be a force of good. And to encourage the same people way. to make great choices. And like, I'll never be a politician because my life will get threatened. People will call me horrible names, especially as a woman. So I could never enter that kind of a space. So I just, you know, spout off, spout off, spout off when people put a mic in front of me like you're doing unknowingly you're thinking i'm just going to talk about rock and roll but no <laughs> um i'm gonna use my voice and remind people that they can be anyone they want to be and that every choice is a reflection on who you are and how your behavior directly affects your neighbors yeah and i think people are forgetting that for some reason i don't know why I, I end every single podcast I have from the first episode with don't be an asshole, live hard, play hard. And most of all, don't, um, and most of all, believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. Simple advice. Mm -hmm. And be kind. And be kind. It's, it makes you feel good. It does. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up here with two quick questions. Star Wars or Star Trek? Oh, Star Trek, Patrick Stewart. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And how good is that new, uh, that new one with with Patrick Stewart going to be? Is that out yet? It's not out yet, right? So I saw there's a series, but I only saw a couple of episodes. 
and then I started watching the Americans. So oh. I, <laughs> it won. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's, it, it's always the hardest question for me when people talk about like career highlights. Mm -hmm. For me, there were so many amazing things that happened. It's the same parallel for you, but can you nail it down to one thing? Um, I think I'm always most proud of what I'm doing most recently, especially when I make it happen. So my podcast, the, you know, the reinvention of the VJ, I don't know if people even know about it, but well, I'm now. interviewing, pardon me. I said, they will now I'm going to pound the shit out of this interview. <laughs> okay, please do. Online. It's, it's, um, you know, it, it, I came up with the idea. I reach out to all these people to convince them to trust me to do a one hour, you know, conversation with them. Um, and then I have to get it, you know, produced. And then I have to, you know, rely on everybody to share it. That's, you know, it's, it's a grassroots kind of thing. I don't work for a big company and certainly much music is not promoting it because we don't always have the kindest things to say about much. Although we say, amazing things because it changed all of our lives you know there is there's a few jabs at you know the the evolution of much etc mm -hmm. um but for me that podcast not only has been very creatively fulfilling during lockdown and has given me something to work on but it's reconnected me with people that i was very close with about 30 years ago we all went our separate ways and it also is healing a few wounds because it was in many ways kind of traumatic to grow up in front of a country uh, in my formative years. From the time I was 21 to 35, mm. every day I was in front of the country with no script and live TV and shit happened during like on camera and also behind the scenes that were challenging and um, stressful. And uh, now I get to talk about all of those things with all my peers and to tell those stories. And it's for me, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that for people listening, it's you know entertaining, et cetera. But for me, it gets really emotional because these are people who I have been really close with and we're talking about stuff that happened to us when we were quite young and um yesterday i spoke to i don't know if you know who mike campbell is oh yeah well he wasn't he was, even like the mike and mike exactly cross, cross canada mike and mike yeah so we talked about we were on the we were on zoom for three hours wow i think the show will only be about two hours long but he and i go back since way before much i'm not telling anybody mm -hmm. how but there's a crazy story about how we knew each other and therefore how i actually got him his first job at much nobody knows that story so those are the kinds of things that um that we talk about and it's the kind of thing you know when someone said to me if, like people who always say eric you should do a podcast you're about like for three years do a podcast i was like yeah. What the fuck can I talk about that no one else can talk about? Like, I don't want to talk about motherhood, even though my website is about, like, for 15 years, I've been the voice of moms in Canada. But I didn't want to do a podcast about motherhood. And I also didn't want to do a thing about much music because I, it's old news. But I thought, you know what? I would love to talk about much music, but also talk about reinvention and how each of us had our heyday at much, but then we've all had careers or haven't. Some people haven't had a great life after much. And so it's that concept of reinvention and how you can make something happen when times are tough is actually the subplot of the podcast. And so only I can do that because reinvention is something that I've managed to do many times and no one else has had that kind of a career who left much and who likes to do interviews the way I do. So it's a really special piece and I hope to keep it going for 
um, quite a while. Yeah, I, I think that I, I'm pushing you to talk to the people that you know that own businesses, that run businesses, and get them to sponsor you. Make some dough out of it. If you're going to take a little bit of time to create such a cool and a unique content, you know, make it worth your time. Yeah, it's not money isn't my first objective with this, but it certainly would be helpful to sure. for the production and, you know, and to get it in front of more people. So you never know. But yeah. really, the most helpful thing is by you sharing it and people who are listening to listen, to share, to uh, review it on like Apple podcasts and stuff. It's great, really helpful. Yeah. And to subscribe. Yep. That's the tricky part. Well, we've lot lots of people subscribing so far. Oh, great. Because it's guaranteed to be good. Yeah. Right? They, they know pretty much every host that is there. And um, they're just great stories. So right. right delivered to your to your phone. Right. How simple is that? Yeah. Erica, you are the best. You're like truly an inspiration for me to do what I am doing today through my radio career and everything. I can't stress it enough. Thank you so much for, for hanging out and, and being part of the podcast here today. Well, thanks for uh, reaching out to me on Twitter. <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, you're easy to find on Twitter and Instagram, simply your name, Erica M. Yeah. Uh, I guess we will wrap it up with that and we'll see you online. You bet.